Thank you for joining us this evening for the International Lecture Series, one of the power plant's longest running programs. We extend sincere thanks to our generous lead donors, Nancy McCain and Bill Morneau. I would also like to acknowledge our primary education sponsor, CIBC, for their generous support of all education and public programs at the power plant. I also extend thanks to our institutional supporters, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Arts Council. We are lastly grateful to BMO for All Year, All Free, which allows free year-round access to the gallery. We are currently showing the exhibitions Fogid by Ito Barada, Some Weep, Some Blow Flutes by Maria Laboda, and Crossfade by Latifa Eshak. Programs like this are free for members of the power plant, but ticketed for everyone else. So of course, we encourage you to become a member to take advantage of this, one of the many benefits of membership. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Terence Gower uh, to deliver this international lecture series program. Terence Gower was born in British Columbia. He studied at Emily Carr College spent the early years of his practice in Vancouver, Cologne, Germany, and Mexico City, and has continued to show widely internationally. Uh, the power plant became familiar with Terence back in 2012 uh, on a member's trip, uh, patron trip, to uh, Mexico City, uh, visiting the Labor uh, Gallery. Since 1995, Terence has been based in New York City though he also resides in Mexico City and some of the year in France. And as we'll hear this evening, he has spent considerable time in Cuba, especially over the past one and a half years. In New York City, Terence has shown at PS1, the New Museum, the Queen's Museum, and several commercial and nonprofit galleries. In Canada, he has exhibited works at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, the Odain Gallery in Vancouver, and during the summer of 2002 at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery in a group exhibition entitled Stretch, curated by Keith Wallace and Eugenio Valdez Figueroa. Following his introduction to Figueroa, Gower's project Functionalism was exhibited at the 2003 Havana Biennial, planting the seeds for his current project. Additional notable exhibitions include at the Hirschhorn Museum in Washington, D.C., the Museo Tamayo in Mexico City, and the Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin. Gower has also built four pavilions, the Bicycle Pavilion for the Colección Humex in Mexico City, the Projection Pavilion, also in Mexico City, the Workshop Pavilion in León, Spain, and Superpuesto for the Bronx Museum in New York City. A new public commission from the New York School Construction Authority was recently installed in the borough of Queens in New York, and a major new commission from the French Région uh, Rhône-Alpes will be inaugurated in Saint-Genis-Puy in spring of 2017. Among numerous awards, Gower has received a Canada Council long-term grant, a John Simon Guggenheim Mem Memorial Fellowship, and a Cité des Arts Fellowship in Paris. His works and his words have been published widely, his videos have been screened equally widely, and he's organized notable exhibitions at diverse venues, including El Museo del Barrio in New York, the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC, and El Museo de la Ciudad de México. Finally, he has lectured widely from New York to Los Angeles, Vancouver to Mexico City, Vienna to Havana, which of course leads to this evening's lecture. So please give a warm welcome to Terence Gower. Thank you for the introduction and thank you Power Plant for inviting me here back to Canada. Um, as you can imagine, it's wonderful to be back in Canada after the last uh, week in the US, New York. Um, 
after I'm going to be speaking for about an hour, and if you if you have any questions about that, we can uh, we can certainly discuss that as well. And any any specific questions about kind of contemporary reality in Cuba as well, if anyone's interested in in um, in talking about that. So I'm actually that was a great introduction. Thanks, Joshua, because uh, I was going to start with just a couple of images of of the works that you just mentioned, and then um, I'm the idea was to focus on. We'll see if we have time for three, uh, three of these sort of research projects, research-based projects that are listed here on the screen. Um, the main, obviously, the, the first one I'm going to start with is the um, is Havana case study, which is which just just opened ex about a week and just over a week ago in New York at Simon Preston Gallery. So we actually uh, kind of rushed the rushed the production on the piece in order to get it installed and um, on show before the before the elections, knowing that what happened in the elections was going to have a big effect on on this particular building in Cuba. So. Um, just, I'm just going to run very through very quickly, just to give you an idea of how how my practice works. Um, I I generally work on these large bodies of work that that can take decades to develop, with a number of works in each body of work, um, different themes. Um, this is from the from the for this long study I've been doing about pavilions. Um, that's a piece of called five notable pavilions. This is this is the bicycle pavilion that Yosho just mentioned. This is Projection Pavilion. This is Superpuesto, which was done in New York in the Bronx a couple of, a couple of years ago and was used for educational reasons, um, as a kind of educational function, weddings, uh, parties, and this kind of thing. Um, these, each time, when I, when I kind of bring to complete a body of work, I'll generally publish a book. So the book on the left is a, a book on my pavilions, display architecture. The one on the right is a book on my videos. Um, Ciudad Moderna. Uh, one of my videos, this is just a still, another still from Polytechnic. Um, this is a still from Wilderness Utopia, and I'm gonna, if we have time, I'll show you a little bit, a clip of this a bit later when I talk about the, the project from the Hirshhorn that this was related to. And this is New Utopias, the, uh, the introduction segment. Um, the, another body of work is a, is a large body of work it's been, been working on for about the last 10 years on post-war sculpture, and so I've been doing these studies of, uh, of artists like Barbara Hepworth and Noguchi, and that, um, and that will come to be brought together in this book, um, Form, Model, Syntax, Display, coming out next autumn with, uh, with Black Dog. This is one of the works in the book. It's um, uh, mobile, room-sized mobile called Free Association. It's been shown, it's originally commissioned by the um, IAC in Lyon in France. Um, this is actually that school, uh, this commission from the school in New York that we just mentioned, part of it. And uh, it's inter the, you'll, you'll see the United Nations building is going to come up a couple of times. But this is a, this is a number of studies I've done of a, of a Hepworth piece um, called Single Form that's, that stands in front of the United Nations building in New York. And finally, this is the, this is the commission being installed uh, about a month and a half ago, just outside Geneva. And in that piece, I'm, I've done an exact copy of the Hepworth sculpture in concrete, in red concrete, and it's sort of broken and spread around the site like a Greek column, sort of like a, I guess, a, um, a ruin. And the, the work on, on post-war sculpture is really, uh, the interest f for me is, is, and it's something that Hepworth talked about, was how abstract art, abstract sculpture, abstract form can, can express or can represent abstract ideas, and it can, it can have ideological connotations as well. And it's a good uh, it's a good way to think about my work on architecture, uh, which we're going to, we're going to look at next. It's it's always been my my specific interest in modern architecture is thinking of it as an abstract medium. It's a you know it's a we're talking about blocks, kind of geometric forms, uh, prismatic forms that um, that can come to acquire meaning. They represent things. They can symbolize things as well. And that's uh, that's a kind of um, a good way to think about this, my work on, on the Havana Embassy. So this is the, this is, this is loosely what is a, this, this large body of work, these very recent, long research, research projects that, that eventually go into, um, into large installations. Um, these are the themes, architecture, urbanism, and it's their, their, their research projects. Um, this is one from just north, a museum just north of, of Stockholm. 
um, dealing with the space and dealing with, uh, with, with sort of Miesian forms in the building. Um, and you'll see in each of these, there's, a, there's generally a, a kind of sculptural element or a video or some, some significant work that operates as a kind of hinge to the installation. Um, I will also, there, there will generally be a display of, of documentation as well. Basically, my, I put my research on display. Um, this is from the Hirshhorn project that we'll hopefully we'll, we'll look at in a minute. Um, and this is Baghdad case study in its original installation at the um, Haus der Kultur und der Welt in Berlin. These are a few details. And this is the same project shown in, at Labor Gallery in Mexico City, which is the gallery that represents me in Mexico. Um, this is a this is from this past summer, and this is a studio shot of the of the kind of research um, that has gone into Havana case study, which I'm going to talk about now. And you'll see one of the modules of the of the sculpture in the background in this photo. So I develop, basically, I bring uh, I work a little bit like a writer. It's 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 writing, it's research, um, and I kind of lay out the lay out the research, analyze it. If through that, I sort of develop an argument, and the argument gets expressed in the work, whatever that is, whether it's a sculpture or a, or a video or a larger installation. So Havana case study. So this, um, you, uh, Joshua mentioned that I, I had a, um, a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation. This, that was in 2010, I think. Um, and I applied for, for, a, for a long research project on US embassy design in the post-war period, so in the 50s and 60s. Um, it's, I was interested in buildings that symbolize, obviously, or can, you know, are representative, and an embassy building is, is, is one of the strongest examples of that. So in, um, and the, and living in the US, the US, the US became my subject. So this is, um, this is an example of what embassy buildings used to look like before, uh, before this program that I've been studying. So up in, you know, for the, for the 100 years up until, uh, up until the 1940s, the late 1940s, the model was, um, often it was kind of, a, they built these little white houses or, or they were working with plantation house uh, architecture. The idea was to, is, was, to, was to build something that symbolized the US and would be, would be represented, would be recognizable as an American um, typology. The, um, what came after the, this period I've been studying is of course this kind of these super fortified citadel type type structures that are now familiar to everyone. So I was interested in the period in between. So what happened, how do we go from that, those kind of you know, uh, pleasureful plantation style buildings to these, these real fortresses? This is the, um, the consulate in Istanbul, built in 2003. And um, you'll see when we if, I, if we, if we have time, we get to Baghdad case study, you'll see, the, you'll see two embassies that kind of book in that project, one from 1960 and one from 2007 that, uh, that represent those two periods. Um, the, the, the best source for anyone researching this is a, is a book by um, Jane Loeffler um, called The Architecture of Diplomacy. And I went to Washington, interviewed her, and um, she kind of let me into her archive, and that's how I started working um, on, the, on the first of the projects, which was the Baghdad project. So these are examples of, of, of this embassy campaign. So in 1949, um, the State Department um, brought in a, uh, a new head of the building's operation um, named Leyland King, and he, and he put together an architecture board with people like Bruno uh, uh, Burleski from, uh, from Oregon and, and um, Ralph Walker from New York, and they started you know, bid, sending out to bid a bunch of embassy jobs uh, to, the best, to the best modern architects in the US. And it was interesting because there were a lot of architects like Jose Luis Sert who hadn't really been in the US for more than 10 years. So it was quite, I, I'm interested in this as kind of a progressive model for, um, for, the, for the US, unusual in, in at the height of the Cold War. So for instance, on the right we have a, that's the, the New Delhi embassy by, um, um, oh, what's his name actually? My, Daryl Stone, exactly, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, of course, we have and, and all, the German, all the German consulates were, uh, were by Bundschaft, you see on the left there. Um, here are some more, this is actually a, um, and this is of course, Jose Luis Sert's uh, Baghdad embassy, which we'll be looking at later. 
So the first, uh, the first contracts went out to one firm from New York um, called Harrison Abramovich, and I'll show you a, uh, a couple of images of other work of theirs as well. And here's, so here's the Havana Embassy. Um, it was completed in 1953. The, the, the contract was, was delivered in around 1950. Um, the, the situation in Havana, um, here you can see it's, a, it's an urbanism plan from 1925 by Forestier. He was one of, he was a French, um, uh, a kind of a houseman, houseman kind of urbanist, and did, uh, did kind of started a, laying out these different alleys and things like this around the city. So these are, these are each partially implemented. This is one by José Luis Sert, again, who's returned. Um, he, did a, he did a number of Latin American city uh, urban, urbanistic plans. It's interesting, the Sert, because he, he proposed, you see kind of on the north side of the, in the bay uh, next to Havana, uh, old Havana, you see it. he's de decided to build this whole new island uh, for the administration of the country. And then across from Old Havana, he was proposing this huge kind of presidential palace. Um, Edificio Foxa, which was when it was built, and this is around the corner from the embassy, was, was considered the largest cast concrete building in, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the, it was also, so we're talking 1950s. This is Hotel Riviera in 1955. Uh, this part of Havana, it's called Verado, was um, was being rapidly developed. The the zoning the zoning laws were completely changed, so people could build uh, almost limitless um, high rises. And there was a new kind of uh, some new funding models. So collaboration with uh, with with foreign investors and um, and the local government. It was a way basically for Batista to get kickbacks from these. And in, in fact, this is a good case. It was built by Meyer Lansky, an American mobster. Um, and was considered kind of one of the more no notorious examples of this, of what was wrong with, uh, with Havana before the revolution. Um, there's the Sert's project for the presidential palace and uh, very much playing with the same forms that he worked with in Baghdad. Um, and so these are, these are the architects. So uh, Harrison Bramwitz were the over, oversaw the, the construction of the UN. Um, of course, the UN was mostly Niemeyer, Oscar Niemeyer, and uh, with, with Le Corbusier there, of course, in the background yelling. Um, but, um, but Harrison Bramwitz were, the, were really the, the lead architects on the project. So they were a logical choice for the first State Department modern buildings that were commissioned in the late 40s. Um, right after the, the, these, these embassies, um, Abramowitz went on to design the CIA headquarters. This is one of the rare photographs that I found actually in his archive, but generally it's difficult to find actually, find photographs of the, uh, of, the, of the headquarters and there are no floor plans anywhere that you can find, which is interesting. He actually had to deliver the plans without any, any delineation of walls or anything inside. That had to be done by CIA architects. Um, the, the first commission to be awarded to Abramowitz was the, was the Rio Embassy, which was completed in 1951. Um, very much playing with Le Corbusier's work down there as well in Brazil. Um, it's interesting because, of course, soon, just a few years after this, the Brasilia got it was start. They started construction on Brasilia, and they had to build a new new U.S. embassy, a little bit like what happened with the uh, with the Cuban embassy. Um, here's the, here's the first rendering, 1950. Um, the location on the on the waterfront. And it was, uh, it was, I was, I was lucky enough to get to know the ambassador this past winter, and and he set up a tour with their kind of facilities people, and um, a very thorough tour. Kind of got to go into the basement and everything, and actually saw their seawater cooling system, where they actually had pipes going way out into the ocean, bringing cool water and cooling the building. It was interesting. The building under construction. And then the, um, some of the, earth, the early sketches for the interiors. So Noel, uh, Noel was brought in to do the interiors and ended up doing a lot of these, these modern, modern embassy buildings. Um, the idea of bringing modern architects in was, was to, to, to put across this idea of the US as a kind of modern, young, optimistic, was, was, very, was very explicit in the State Department's directive, um, new country. That's how, they, that's how they described it. And so, contrary to a lot of the older State Department people, it was you know, raised a lot of eyebrows to have this kind of modern architecture, and especially the interiors was a huge issue uh, because they were working with Knoll. 
And so it was all uh, Saarinen and Eames furniture in the, in the embassy. And ambassadors were completely outraged by this because it didn't have like the dignity of a, of a proper embassy. Um, this, is a good, this is a good example. So this is a conference room on the top floor, which ended up being, uh, being taken out uh, in, in a renovation that happened in the 1990s. Um, here you see, you can see the top floor, it's all kind of illuminated like a, like a loggia. And um, this, you can, you can get an idea from this photograph of the transparency. And this was another really uh, very um, strong directive from the State Department that they wanted buildings that were transparent. And so that was the, for me, that was the clue, the kind of key to, to what happened afterwards. You, when you compare that to these, these fortified embassies like the one in Istanbul, um, you can see how we went from transparency to complete bunkerization on the other side. And so I was looking at the embassy program as a way, as a key to, to analyzing what happened in U.S. Um, uh, external affairs to, to, to make that happen. And uh, there, I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples. So transparency, so you can, at the, at the ground floor, you can see right into the, the heart of the building. There are, there's a courtyard in the back. There's a, there's a kind of glass entranceway. Um, this is the, the top floor. You can see it's kind of open to the elements. Um, and I'll show you, actually, I think I have a shot, another shot of the, the facade. So here's the, um, here's the lobby with the, with the Barcelona chairs, of course, provided by Noel. Noel actually, um, Hans Noel, the, the head of Noel, uh, actually died in Cuba. He was in a car crash when, when he was working on the Cuban embassy. And that's when Florence Noel took over the, the practice. Um, it was interesting because the, the State Department thought, they, they started because, or actually a couple of congressmen in, in, in the US became suspicious that Noel and these architects had some kind of secret uh, arrangement going on. There were kickbacks involved. And they couldn't understand that these architects wanted to work with Noel just because they had good furniture and, uh, and good design. And they were working with the designers that they liked. So here's an example of the, you can see the access. So, I mean, ask yourself the difference here from, from any US embassy you've seen you know, in, the last, in the last 20 years. You see it's completely, there are no, uh, no fences, no, uh, the front doors are completely glass. The idea is you, the, the public can just walk in it was a little. It was designed as a symbol of freedom of of, of expression, as well. So you had, um, as you walked in those front doors, you would have um, the, you, there would be like a auditorium, a, a little library. Uh, there's a little art gallery in there, and and the idea was this, the public was supposed to be it was absolute open arms. Um, around the back was was the visa section, which was also no security. And. So this is, this is the document, the kind of my, my starting to arrange and, and work with the documentation. I put together a display um, that, was, that was designed to look like it was, it, it was set up in about 1958 before the revolution. And so we're, I'll talk in a minute about what happened after the, to the building after the revolution. Um, so after 59, so uh, Castro and the, the Castro brothers and Cienfuegos and the, the Barburas walk, come into Cuba at the begin, very beginning of 1959. The, um, it's left, um, it's, it's quite nebulous at first, what kind, of, what kind of government they're going to form, their overtures to the US government. Um, Castro, just two months after the revolution, goes to the US, he does a series of lectures, he goes to Princeton. Um, he asks for a meeting at the White House, and um, Eisenhower goes golfing, uh, doesn't, doesn't meet him, but he has a meeting with Nixon, um, who just kind of berates him for two hours, and he comes out and he says, well, I guess we're not gonna get along very well, uh, Cuba and the US, and so gradually they start drifting towards the Soviet Union and towards, towards a communist system, but it was, certainly was not, uh, was not a definite, you know, it wasn't carved in stone at all at the, at the moment of the revolution. Um, partly through some of this, you know, some of the signs and some of the actions coming from the U.S., uh, there was this drift towards, towards communism. So by the beginning of 1961, um, two years after the revolution, the U.S. and Cuba break diplomatic relations. And there's a general panic, and um, here you see, uh, you see people trying to get, um, uh, get their visas and get to the U.S. Um, there's another shot. Um, here they're just lining, you know, lining up at the glass doors. The U.S. is um, 
the embassy is closed down. Uh, here they're rolling up the, the flag that would normally stand in front of the embassy. This is the embassy staff um, luggage. Um, you still had regular ferry service between Miami and, and Havana, so they, were, they would just drive the truck onto the, onto the ferry and all the staff would get on and they'd go back to, to the US. So they left a skeleton staff in place just to, just to look after the building after 61. And um, the building stayed the way it was. And I'm interested in the building as a, that it kind of entered this state of limbo, like so much in Cuba. Um, anyone that's been to Cuba or has seen pictures, of course, the cars are the most, you know, the most famous kind of sign of the, that kind of limbo where, where everything sort of stopped, uh, stopped it in 1959, really. No more imports. And obviously, this is a, um, a result of the US led embargo. So, um, the, the embassy itself, after 61, of course, was kind of mothballed and, and never modified. The, the State Department had a number of complaints uh, after it first opened and they were, you know, that they were trying to address. And then everything sort of stopped at that point. Um, very quickly, the embassy became a, um, a kind of central protagonist for the, for the Cuban government for, um, and a central symbol of, of course, the enemy, the US. And so these are, these are um, images from the official newspaper, Granma, um, of these, these enormous marches. They put, you know, they'd, uh, they'd bring together like a million people I actually talking, talk to a, a filmmaker who was, who, was, who was brought in for one of these, these kind of choreographed marches where they pick everyone up at school, they bring them down to the Malecon, the, the seawall, have everyone march in front of the US Embassy. It's always focused on the US Embassy and then picked up and taken back to school afterwards. And, um, y la marcha fue, and so the, which means, of course, the march happened, the protest happened. Um, this is from the English Granma, um, and you can see, uh, again, you can see the, the protesters going by the embassy. You can see the, uh, some of the embassy staff. Actually, this is in 1980, after the embassy was reopened as the US Special Interest Section. So not as a, an official embassy, but as a, um, as a kind of faux embassy, or a kind of uh, an embassy that actually had to do all of its diplomatic relations through the Swiss embassy. Um, but it did have, a, have an embassy staff in place, but no official ambassador. Um, more, more images from Granma. You always see the embassy kind of in the background. It's always in the middle, in the middle of the photograph. Um, this is a block, anti-blockade protest in the 1980s. And you see, actually, in 1980, and you start to see the embassy being repaired a little bit. Um, and then just as a contrast, this is, of course, pre-revolution. Uh, pre the embassy plays a kind of central role in in the idea in the modernization of Cuba and the kind of as a symbol of the modernity. This is a car advertisement for uh, for Hudson cars with the embassy in the background. So it's like look how look how modern Cuba is. So and then things things escalated in in, in 2000 when when George Bush Jr. came into uh, came into power, and um, the 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 Cuban government started putting these huge billboards and kind of surrounding the embassy with these billboards facing the embassy. Uh, these, of course, are the atrocities at Abu Ghraib, um, the uh, the giant swastika, etc., um, calling the Americans fascists. Um, this is another one of the billboards. It says, "Mr. Imperialist, we don't have any fear of you at all." Um, from one island to the other, and so to retaliate. And it's, so this is when, when, the, when the building becomes not just a kind of symbol, but, but actually a, a more of a central protagonist into this, in this kind of public relations war that, that went on for many years between, between uh, Cuba and the US using the embassy as a, as a, as a tool in, the, in this war. Um, the, under, the Bush administration put this giant electronic billboard in the, uh, in the second to top floor. Uh, where actually where, where, the, where the ambassador's office would be, and started basically sending messages to the to the insulting the Cuban government, and and this is of course saying you need democracy in Cuba. Um, just a, just this continual continual line of messages. Like this is one of their main strategies was to try to encourage people to to oppose the Cuban government and to leave the island. Uh, you can, there's a view from, actually from Havana Bay, you can see it from, from all over the city. And you can see the billboard in the background. So the return volley from, on, the, on this public relations war was, was, um, was Castro put up this, uh, what was called the Mountain of Flags. 
uh, with a flag for every year of, of American imperialism in Cuba, and the blacks, the reds, the, the white stars represented all the uh, Americans killed by um, killed in by CIA-backed terrorism, which actually there are there were very many, there were many, um, and the idea was to obscure the front of the building. So it was it's, it started to get kind of childish at this point, but it was uh, it. So everyone, there seemed to be a bit of a sense of humor behind it. Um, then the, the plaza of anti-imperialism was built, um, which has become a main, main, main concert venue in Cuba, um, with the, with, again, with the flags and the embassy as, as a background. This is, I think this is where the Rolling Stones played when they were down there. Um, this is on, on a good day. So this is the, the black flags were flown during the, more or less the whole time the US was, was invading and occupying Iraq. Um, on a good day, they fly Cuban flags. Uh, so for, for on national holidays and things like this. It was funny when I, I talked to the ambassador and, and um, he said they were going out as usual to hang you know, their 138 flags or whatever. And he went out and spoke to the fellow who was hanging the flags and he said, well, what about Alter, you know, now that we have our flag flying in front of the embassy, which of course was installed about a year and a half ago, um, what about alternating American and Cuban flags? And the guy looked at him like he was crazy, and he got a sense then that the, the orders were coming directly from Fidel <laughs> for, for these flags. And at the end of the um, of the Plaza of Anti-Imperialism, you have this this famous statue of Jose Marti pointing accusingly at the embassy. Um, for the for Cubans with a sense of humor, they say uh, they say Marti is saying the exit is that way. Uh, that's the joke about the. Everyone has a has a, a very good sense of irony about the situation. So the um, and then of course um, under Obama we saw the uh, Obama's project of of opening relations with Cuba. Um, there's the embassy as it looks now. This is photo was taken about a year ago. Um, this is the the seal being brought out again and put on the front of the embassy, and that's the flag being raised. They actually had the same Marines that, that lowered the flag in 1961 come back and raise the flag again, this time as a kind of symbolic, symbolic gesture. So the balcony. Um, in, in each of these projects, I, I take a, um, I kind of identify in my research a, an element from the research that will, that I feel represents uh, the argument that I that I want to that I that I'm that I'm developing around around the subject, um, and in this case it was the I hit on the balcony and the balcony, um, the, the balcony is interesting and I, I went to the State Department archives a couple of maybe three or four weeks ago, and um, I found this the report from the State Department when they went down to the embassy in 1953 and looked at it the first time and the and the, and the um, the inspector immediately started complaining about the balcony and for at the beginning of the report he said. We have to get rid of this Mussolini-style balcony on the embassy. It's like a, it's, it was requested by the outgoing uh, ambassador, and uh, it doesn't work. We have to take it off, and of course it stayed because the, the building went into limbo. Um, and it does kind of feel like a tribune. Like, what were they thinking? Here you see it. Um, here you see it on the kind of blank facade facing the facing the sea. There's a lot of you know the area around there, so it, it is a little bit like the ambassador can come out and address. The public and has a slightly tribune, well, a major like kind of tribune quality. Um, it could be that he just goes out there and drinks a cup of coffee or something, but it really looks more like a imperial um, tribune. And so that became the form. I also the this, the the sculptural form of the balcony is I found I found very interesting, very beautiful, and that's as as kind of the main sculptural element on the building. Um, here it is in that news photograph. And so, so the installation, the central part of my installation is a, is a scale, is a one-to-one -one re reconstruction of the balcony um, in, as, as a kind of drawing in space. So it's delineated um, in, in, in this material, which is, of course, rebar. Uh, okay, why rebar? The, uh, under the embargo in Cuba, there's very, as, 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 like I mentioned in, with the material culture, there's very little available, very little materials. And it's interesting being there as an artist because there's, um, you try to, <clears throat> you try, like in the biennial, um, if you're trying to make something there, it's very difficult. There, almost nothing is available uh, as far as artist materials, as far as what you're used to as an artist. 
One of the things that you see everywhere is rebar. It's a, it's a material that's still produced in Cuba. It's one of the few materials produced there, and it is more or less stolen and resold from construction sites all over the country, and people use it to build everything. So here's a, so I, would, I, I went around and kind of photographed where I saw the, saw the material used. This is just in chairs, in a restaurant. It's all made of rebar. This is a children's fairground. Uh, everything's made of rebar. Um, this is great. This is a this is at a, at a at a Soviet resort on the south coast, and um, it's kind of the history of the Cuban Revolution done in rebar. Um, so incredible, incredible crafts work. So I mean, it's the, this is this is the culture of what 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 the Cubans refer to as inventos, um, which are inventions that you use that you, that you things that you invent through necessity. Um, it's something, something, of course, you see all over Africa and many, many, many parts of the world. And in Cuba, they're particularly inventive in, in, with, with this kind of scarcity. So, um, so this, was the, this was the idea of the rebar. The rebar, of course, is, is on, the, on the sculpture is not, normally it would be, of course, be embedded in the object. And, but in this case, I decided to use it as almost like a drawing material to delineate the, um, the outside of the, of, the, of the object. I also like the idea that it's, um, it's open to the viewer to decide if it's a thing under construction or is it a ruin? I mean, is it a thing that's about to, is it a balcony about to be hoisted into place or is it, has it just come crashing down and is left kind of resting on the sidewalk? Um, other inventos. So there's a, another material, of course, that's, uh, that's available and is plentiful of its leaves, uh, like palm leaves. Uh, there's incredible, incredible things done with woven palm leaves. Um, and so this is another this is another sculpture series from this from this project, which is uh, which are balcony modules, kind of uh, with elements with woven woven rattan, uh, filling the elements. So if you if you were trying to generate that form of the balcony under the embargo with limited materials uh, available to you, here's a possible way of doing it. So the other the other element in the exhibition this is this is the show that opened last week in, in New York is um, this series of collages. So what you have in the background are the kind of uh, cropped outtakings of the document display, and then collage on top of those are the things that occurred after 1959. So it's like you have the original documents about the construction and the design of the building, and then you have all of the shit that happened after. So from you know the protests, um, here you have the null drawings, and then you've got the, uh, the electronic billboard over top. A lot of the images that we just looked at. The flags, of course. And then this, these images we also saw. And then finally, the, um, the sculptural aspect of the, of, of the central piece of the show, of course. Um, this is a shot of the, of the show at Simon Preston. Um, it occupies, it occupies this, the, the box of the space as a kind of single object, was, was interesting to me, and you see it in perspective the way you see it in those news photographs, the balcony. Um, okay, we have half an hour left, so I'm gonna do like, I'm gonna rush through this. Um, so before, if, if we have time, we'll look at the Baghdad uh, case study, which was the first in the embassy series, but I thought, um, I wanted to show you this as a project that's much closer to home. It's a piece um, that I did for the Hirshhorn Museum um, as a commission um, that, ended up bringing me back to Canada and in, in the research. Um, the Hirshhorn, we all know, I'm sure. So when the Hirshhorn invited me to do a, um, to do a solo project, I decided, I, of course, I, I said, well, you know, the building is amazing, I want to research the building and find out how this UFO landed on the mall, which is the, the most kind of charged site in the US, the most ceremonial site. And, um, the research was incredible. The uh, the story was amazing. There was, you know, of course, as usual, Congress, uh, right wing congressmen tried to shut it down. Started a witch hunt. Um, it was uh, anti Semitic in many ways because it was it, the whole project. Of course, was backed by Joseph Hirshhorn, uh, who was a, a Latvian Jew that came over in in right around the turn of the last century, uh, escaping the pogroms. Um, and set up in New York, rags to riches, you know, by age 20, he had a million dollars from the trading stock at the curbside stock exchange. Um, I just love these Esto images of the, of the building, it's incredible. So this is Hirshhorn, so he, um, he 
Right at the crash, 1929, he sold, he basically sold everything, got out of the stock market, and came to Canada and started speculating in, in, um, in mining. And that's, that's where the money comes from, where the real money comes from. Um, so he was, he was, you know, northern Saskatchewan, uh, nickel, copper, these kind of things. Um, he had a whole crew that was, that was, that was um, prospecting for him. This is Hirshhorn in a, in a mine, actually. Um, until 1953, um, up around, up between Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie, um, some of you might know this, this story, but he, he basically made the largest uranium strike in, um, in history. And he became the uranium king. And he made something like $150 million overnight. So he, um, so I discovered this basically going into the Smithsonian archives and going into the, the I, I, got a, I got a grant actually from the Smithsonian Institution to do the, to do the, the research. Um, I was in their archives, the Getty has had material, um, the Canadian Architecture Archives, which is incredible in Calgary. Um, they have the Parkin Archive. Um, and the, so he just, soon after this, this uh, discovering all this uranium, um, he of course, uh, the, his sole client of course is, becomes the Canadian government. And their sole client of course becomes the Pentagon. Um, and we're talking about the, you know, the really at the height of the arms race. Um, and he decides to build a city in, in, at the site of the mines. Um, in, it's actually called Blind, Blind River, this area. Um, it was an area of just kind of cottages and mostly American, uh, American owners that would go up there in the summer. And suddenly he's, you know, he's staked out this enormous, enormous, enormous territory and they're starting to sink mines and, and, um, and exploit the uranium that's there. So he decides to, because he's been dealing in mining for some time, and mining towns are notoriously lawless, uh, unplanned, you know, uh, disasters, he decides to build the most beautiful mining town on, in the world. Um, and he's already collecting art. Uh, he started collecting art in his 20s. Um, so by this time, he's, he's friends with, you know, Picasso and Lipschitz and all these people, and he's starting to commission work from them for this new city. Um, the city was, will be called Hirshhorn, Ontario. This is, and this is the, the initial model by Philip Johnson. So he, he commissioned Johnson with, uh, with Parkin as kind of collaborating architect from Toronto. Um, this I love, it's, it's his first planning brief um, where he says to build this, the town will be built towards happy living. So there's this kind of, there's a nice, nice kind of um, utopian aspect to the, to the whole project. Uh, my project is called Public Spirit, and I'm very interested in this, you know, there's been a lot of uh, enormous amount of discussion of privately funded public space, and this is kind of the ultimate version. It's a, it's a, um, it's a single person who's decided to finance this, uh, this, entire, this entire city. Uh, you, could t you could say some of the Bata, like Zlin and these places are, are comparable. Some of the cities like Kitimat that were, that were, you know, that were um, built for the smelters for these different companies in northern British Columbia. But this is really one man's vision, you know, with, with this kind of crazy architect that, he's, that he wanted to bring in and collaborate with. Um, later, you know, as, uh, all of the analysis of Philip Johnson is, is, another, is another story. There's no time for that, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting story there as well. What, what were his motives behind wanting to build this, this town in the wilderness of Ontario? Um, this is the Toronto Financial Post. Um, so, and this is 50, 1955, so, so Hirshhorn and Phil Johnson held, called this huge press conference in Toronto. All the newspapers did huge front page articles about this town that was gonna, this is, this is great. You know, it's just a picture of the forest with, you know, here's where the art gallery is gonna be, the shopping center, et cetera, et cetera. So incredible, uh, incredible ideas on, for, for this town. Um, and, very quickly, the, the provincial government, of course, had, had, had not issued permits. There was no, there was no infrastructure in place. They were like, what are you talking about? How, come, you know, how could this be on the front page of the paper in a whole city, and we don't know anything about it? Nobody's told, talked to us. So, so, of course, he started meeting resistance from the, from the federal government. There was a lot, it was kind of like a boom, you know, boom town mentality in that area at the time. There was a uranium rush, very much like a gold rush. So. Um, this, the little towns around there were making a killing, of course, in hotels and restaurants and things, and all the people that were coming in to, ex to exploit the uranium. And um, the, um, 
he very quickly lost uh, lost interest, uh, Joseph Hirshhorn, and kind of uh, they actually cleared part of the site, um, started pouring foundations, and finally he stopped the money and said, no, we're going to pull out, um, even after commissioning the sculptures, etc. So the project was stopped in 1955, and um, he kind of brought his interests back to the U.S., um, started collecting art more seriously, and ended up about I guess ten years later, they hatched the project for the for the for the museum in Washington. Um, and so, this of course is the this is Elliott Lake. Uh, it's very close to Elliott Lake, actually, the site. And this is a this is a photo by Robert Del Tradici, who is who who allowed me to use use this photograph in my installation of um, of of the tailing walls of, from Hirshhorn's mines, basically, and what they've done to the environment up there. So this is, I was inter very interested in that as well, what um, the meaning, because it was this kind of uranium rush, uh, what was the meaning of the sound of the Geiger counter? Because there's a lot of talk of like the excitement of like, you know, we're, we're, we're finding uranium and nobody, you know, 1953 really knew the, the full effects of uranium, what it, what it was going to do to the environment, what it was going to do to people's health, et cetera. So that became part of the project as well. To see to see how that evolved, you know, at one point that beep of the Geiger counter went meant like progress, future, fortune, and within 15 years it meant Armageddon. I mean, it meant the end, the end of the world uh, for 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 people. You know, to hear that was the sound in the kind of the day after that that film. Um, how do I how did I express the argument? The piece was uh, the piece was a single room installation. Um, the documents were in, of course, in vitrines, and there was there was a, a sculpture sculpture pair. I think I've got more details on that. So, so the the idea with the video is a little bit like um, like I mentioned with the sculpture. It could kind of be interpreted in two very different ways. Uh, the, about half of the half of the public that saw this piece were like, "I want to go live there. It's incredible." And the other was, were the other half were that's the most terrifying place on earth, there's, you know, it's, and um, the sculpture is, again, a sim similar idea to the, to the balcony piece. Um, uh, let me just go forward quickly, the sculptures. So they're based, of course, on the, uh, on the principal buildings. And they could be a, you know, is it, are they under construction or is it, the, is it after the nuclear holocaust kind of thing? The, are they the skeletons of the buildings? Um, a li just a little bit of the documentation, so these are the vitrines. Um, there was one, so the, uh, once the town project was halted, Hirsch, um, Johnson actually did design one building that was built, which was, a, which was called the guest house. It was a country house. It was supposed to be kind of the guest house to a much larger house for Hirshhorn. And here he is at the house with all the knoll furniture, of course, arriving. Um, these are from different archives. This, is the, this shows Philip Johnson and, and Hirshhorn in the snow surveying the house. And there he is with his family at the house. Um, good. So we have about we have about 15 minutes. Is that okay? And I'll, we'll look very quickly at the at the at the third project. Um, if people aren't overwhelmed, and then we, we can have some questions. The um, this was so this was a commission from the from the House der Kultur und der Welt in Berlin, um, which which I was excited about because it's um, it's a building built in 1957 as a as a gift from the um, from the American people to the West Berliners, and I like the idea of it. I, I was, you know, it's super ideologically charged, and it's the idea was it was a it was supposed to be the super modern uh, contemporary American building, um, and the as the, the architect um, Hugh Stubbins said, it was it was it should be a shining beacon of freedom pointed towards the east, kind of thing. So he saw it as a kind of propaganda. Piece so exa exactly my interest. Um, what I what I what I loved is that the the Berlin mayor at the time just kind of said thanks very much and turned it into a a kind of um, an instrument for dialogue and and used it of course for what its purpose was which was Congress and for dialogue with between the East and the West. It was built right at the uh, at the edge of the wall before the wall went up actually this 57. Um, some interior shots. And then in the, the end of the 80s, it was turned into what's called the House of World Cultures in Berlin. And with the program dealing with, um, obviously with culture from around the world. This was, a, this was part of a, this, was, this project was commissioned for a show 
called Architecture and Ideology, which is obviously my, my specialty, by, um, by the curator at the time, which was named Valerie Smith. And um, I, she knew I, was, I had started this research from the, you know, with the Guggenheim Fellowship, and uh, we started talking. She said, well, would you present that project here for the first time? So, um, so back to CERT. So CERT, of course, um, was commissioned. This, this opened in 1960, so following the, the Havana project. Um, they continued to, as you saw, you know, the um, uh, Gropius did, did Athens, a bunch of leading architects in the US did different embassies. And um, I was interested, I came across this project reading an article about the new embassy that was built in 2007, which was, which was the largest, most expensive, um, most fortified embassy built by any country anywhere in the world. Um, that was, of course, built after the US occupied, uh, occupied Iraq. And so I was interested in this kind of kinder, gentler time, 1960. Um, the US is, is making a big uh, diplomatic gesture. This is just the ambassador's house, but it's actually quite a large compound. Um, the, this is interesting because a lot of the criticism of the, of the Havana Embassy was that it was really about its kind of universalism, that it's, it, the, the problems with the building were that it, weren't, it wasn't properly designed for the, um, for the tropical climate. Um, in contrast, after that, they started, and I think this is very enlightened of the State Department, they started sending the architects for these embassy projects to the, to the sites, to the, to the countries where they'd be building, um, to, spend a, to spend like three or four weeks investigating and researching the local building technologies and cultures and traditions and things like that. That's what you see on the brief here. Um, so CERT came up with this complex right on the Tigris. Um, huge, you know, a huge compound. Again, very open. Um, the, the main administrative buildings were completely open. Um, the, what happened really in the embassy program was the really starting in about, uh, really with Saigon, I guess in Beirut, starting in the mid 60s, the embassy started coming under attack, of course. Um, the, the State Department may have had the best intentions, but these were kind of little mini US governments, and one element of the US government, of course, is the CIA. So they would have offices in these embassies. So the, the, the State Department may be thinking diplomatic overtures, uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, meanwhile, in the basement, you've got the CIA plotting the overthrow of the, of the host government. Um, and so you, you've got this kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing going on all the time. It was interesting in the, um, the a good case in point is the actual Congress Halle in Berlin, where the, where, the show, where the piece was shown the first time. That was a project by Eleanor Dulles, who was a sister of the Dulles brothers. And the Dulles brothers, one was ahead of the CIA and one was ahead of the State Department. She, and she was put in charge of the Berlin reconstruction after the war. And so she was interested in these kind of like gestures. You know, to the, so they built Freie Universität, they built the Bikini House and these different buildings. And um, the Congress Hall was one of those, although it was also a propaganda device. And, so, and she, she, she went on the record saying, it's a shame that my brother, the head of the CIA, constantly undermines my, uh, my work you know, in, in diplomacy. So you're always seeing this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing going on. Um, and of course, this is what leads to the embassies coming under attack. Uh, they're attacking their host governments, and of course, people, they start coming back under attack themselves. Um, early drawings. And so my, looking, again, looking for a kind of a handle or a, an element in the, in the project that I could, I could work with uh, sculpturally. Um, I hit upon the roof of, this, of the ambassador's house, which is, uh, when I first saw it, I was thinking it's, uh, it reminded me of kind of festival architecture. It's a little bit like if I went out to the CNE today, and it's funny, you see some of this kind of crinkly tent roof kind of structure. It's like Festival of Britain. They call it Festival Modernism. Um, but when I looked at the, at the, at the roof in plan, um, you realize it's a series of little pyramidal domes. Um, and you, I realized, well, the Caravan Sarai, of course, the bazaar are, have this system of kind of gridded domes um, as, a, as a cooling device. So he was observing the local, um, local building techniques. And of course, the, um, you know, the, the kind of patterning that you have in, in, mar in marquetry, marquetry, Islamic marquetry. So my project was to rebuild, to do, to do a, a scale copy of the roof in, in a material and then tip it up so it ends up being a kind of artifact. 
And we worked with, um, we worked in credit with an incredible fabricator in Berlin who did the piece in cedar, uh, which is a traditional, if, if, a traditional wood used. Uh, of course, normally it would be Lebanon cedar that you'd be using in, in the Middle East, but uh, we worked with red cedar. So it's a red cedar veneer on plywood. Incredible piece of cabinet making. And so this was the original installation of the piece. Um, and you can see, you can get a sense of kind of the geometry of the, of the facade. So this is an exact replica of, of the roof form, um, but turned into this kind of ob you know, uh, museum object. There's the scale, and then of course the documentation in these, in these, in these vitrines. Um, so, it's, so I worked with 10 vitrines, um, when the piece was shown later at La Bourge, um, I don't know, Gaetan, if you saw that project. Yeah, um, it was done on a single large table instead of instead of the vitrines, which I was happier with. Actually, I liked it kind of being all all the documentation being together, and the idea was to kind of to to kind of touch down in points uh, of of the diplomatic history between the U.S. and Iraq. And of course, you know, it's it's the last 20 years, of course, or 15 years have been very problematic, as we know. Um, one of the things I use a lot, uh, and you see, you see it in the Havana project, is this red tinting. It's a strategy I use all through my work. You'll see the color red kind of recurring over and over. It's partly a reference to, to kind of a, the early modern avant-garde, but also to the way um, photographs were, were tinted in architectural magazines in the 50s to kind of make it to create a more kind of dynamic uh, composition. Um, I was fascinated with the photographs that I found in the archive and what, you know, how they traveled. So you have to have all the writing and things. And so I showed that as well. The compound, of course, done in cedar. Um, and then this is where I get into a, little, a bit more the, the directly into the history. Um, this is actually a piece that was shown. It's a piece called Cause and Effect. And it's where I talk about that ex very explicitly about where the US, um, what kind of inter, basically the CIA activity in different countries so you have, a, you have three, three chart form, charts here. In the center, you have US embassy construction. And I'm looking at from the, from the Cuba embassy, basically, until the new directives for um, fortification came out in the, in the early 80s. It took them that long. And so what you have in that central line are all the embassies. The chart, the architecture of the chart actually reflects kind of peaks in activity in these areas. So. Um, the, and above, um, below that, you have US kind of interventions in other countries' sovereign territory, usually hatched through these embassies. And like I said, it's usually the CIA. Um, and then at the top, on the top chart, you have attacks on US foreign properties. And these are the significant ones. So you'd have Beirut, you'd have Saigon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can, it's up to the viewer. I mean, are there connections? Can you make connections? Is, it, is there a cause and effect? Um, it's, it's kind of left open. And there, you, there as well, you see the peaks in activity of the attacks and in, in, the, um, and in the US attacks on these other countries. This piece was shown most recently at the, uh, at the Vita David in a show about, called the, what was it, it was called um, Art in the Age of Asymmetrical Warfare. <laughs> This is, this is important. This is a piece, um, it's one of the vitrines, and this was shown in, shown in the installation in Mexico as well. And what you, it's, it's all, all this documentation from State Department and CIA archives around this central document, which is, a, um, which is called the Iraq Liberation Act. And it was a, this is when you discover that the, the project to invade Iraq was something that had been going on for many years. So Clinton was more or less forced to sign this thing with a gun to his head in 1997. It was the height of the Lewinsky scandal. And it was, it's basically the, the document that made it legal for Bush to invade Iraq later. Um, uh, it's an act of Congress that says we can invade Iraq. So amazingly, signed by a Democrat president, but uh, did he have a choice? I don't know. Um, the very quickly, I mean, I've just got like, like five minutes here, but the, um, when the fall of the Soviet Union, um, this, is, this is a kind of a story that I uncovered reading a lot of accounts of the US invasion. Um, I never talk about it as a war, I talk about it as an invasion and an occupation. The, um, the fall of the Soviet Union, the US emerged as, as a sole superpower. Um, the, a group of, of US um, congressmen, uh, you know, um, um, 
Cheney was involved, you know, di different people in the US government who eventually became the neoconservatives, um, got together and made a, drafted a document called the Defense Planning Guidance, which was a kind of shopping list. Um, so it's like, well, we have carte blanche, we can do whatever we want, what do we want to do in the world? And at the top of the list was Iraq. We're gonna take Iraq, it's on top of that, it has the largest oil reserves. This is 1991, it was leaked to the New York Times scandal, I've immediately forgotten. And, but it set the wheels in, in motion. Um, of course, Cheney eventually got into power again and managed to, managed to have his way in 2003 with this invasion. So it was, it, was a, it, was it was in planning for 12 years. Before the, and of course, 9-11 happened. Great, there's a, there's a premise to actually go in and no relationship at all, of course, to, to, to Saddam Hussein, but, but they, they managed to pull it off and we're living with the results now, of course. Um, this, was, this was important to me, so this, so I'm, like I said, I'm kind of touching down in these very s sensitive points and very formative points in the, in the, in the relationship between the US and Iraq. Um, this was the lead up to the invasion. When Ted Turner was interviewed after the, after the invasion, he said, oh, the, the war in Iraq was Murdoch's war. You know, he designed it, kind of thing, and he did it through the press. Um, here's the new U.S. Embassy built in 2007. So there's a little bit of a text at the bottom that describes it. Um, yeah, it, I think it was, yeah, it was designed for 15,000 people. It's incredible. And so, and this is the last vitrine where you can see the, I don't know if you can see the red outlines on the, on the map. Actually, here's a detail um, of the former. So there's the South Embassy on the right, both in the green zone. And on the bottom, of course, is the new embassy. You can just kind of compare the scale. Here's the installation in, in Mexico. Um, all the documentation now on one large table. Um, so uh, very much the format I'm using with the, uh, with the Cuba installation as well. In, in New York right now, we're showing it without the, without the document display. So it's just the sculpture and the, and the collage elements. And there's the, that's what's called Baghdad screen. Here we have the, the red tinted photos on the wall this time. And this is my last image, amazingly, it's 59 minutes, um, of the ambassador's house as it stands. This was, photo was taken about five years ago. So, and that's the condition that we're, it's amazingly still there, but, but um, that's kind of the reality over there now. And I think that's it. I think I've covered everything. We can have questions. Is there any questions? So I'll start the ball rolling. Um, so when you think back on your practice, where is this rooted, this sort of interest in architecture and sort of looking back into the, the origins of very specific structures? Mm -hmm. um, well, the interest in architecture is, is, is a very deep-seated thing for my family. Um, I don't think you mentioned it, but I'm, I'm from a family of architects, and um, I, speci specifically modern architecture. Um, I grew up in a town in British Columbia that was so small that my father designed like, you know, all the, all the municipal buildings and all the houses of all of our friends and the school and ski hill and everything. So I kind of grew up within his project. And so that became my, one of my central projects to investigate that idea of the kind of, um, of social engineering, I guess. Um, in, in modern architecture. So the, the, the drive, I think, for the, the kind of an engine for the whole, for the whole project is that. Um, then, then I think it's, it's, it's what buildings represent. And I, like, I, love, I love to think of them as abstract objects that, that take on meaning that then changes. And they keep, people keep associating different meanings. So of course the architect associates uh, meaning to the building, like Hugh Stubbins, the shining beacon, et cetera, and then the, the, the building acquires other meaning. And so I'm very interested in that journey of, of how, how the meaning of the building changes and how it, what it represents uh, keeps evolving and changing. Um, it's, and again, of course, abstract sculpture. So that piece by Barbara Hepworth, um, when the UN commissioned it and put it up, it, of, course, of course it represented the unity of the United Nations, et cetera, et cetera, but to a US congressman, it represents the waste of the United Nations, like they're building, they're commissioning sculptures. It's like, why are we paying our dues and they're paying Barbara Hepworth to make these pieces? So, 
So that's what I mean by the change in meaning that, that an abstract object architecture can, can take on. Silence. Two little footnotes to add. Good, good. Which are supportive of your arguments, mm -hmm. as far as I can tell. Well, one is supportive, the other one is just a, an interesting detail. The supportive one is that I'm told, I was told in Cuba, that the statue of Jose Marti that you showed in your mm -hmm. presentation, he's holding a child he is, yeah. arm, and the child is supposedly Alien Gonzalez. Yeah. Is, was, you've been told that it's. It was put up during the Elian, definitely. Yeah, um, when I went to in summer 2000, no, summer, sorry, May 2012, yeah. and we were there, and uh, someone from, uh, he was Cuban but not really Cuba, mm -hmm. he called it revolutionary kitsch. Like that statue <laughs> is facing the American embassy, yeah. kind of saying, like, we got him back. Yeah. It was a giant. Um, propaganda moment for both sides, like huge. And, and some people say Elian is responsible for the Iraq war. I mean, there are people that be, by, by basically, you know, losing, uh, causing, you know, the Democrats to lose that election that got Bush elected, da, da, da. It, basically he lost Florida because of, because of Elian. Um, which is possible. Yeah, which was Gore, I guess, right? Yeah, so Gore lost Florida because, of, because the Americans wimped out on, on Elian or whatever. And, lost the Cubans in Florida, which then led to Bush being elected, et cetera, et cetera. So, so people will trace it back to, to Elian. But, and I've heard, I, I have heard that. I haven't looked that closely. It's, you know, if it's. So the other, the other little detail, which is not so important, but um, I, did, I didn't know that Hershey was completely new to me the first of these, Philip Johnson, because the town, yeah. Yes. Because I'm blanking on the name. It's, it's, it's a college, St. Thomas. It's St. Thomas College, St. exactly. Thomas yeah. College. So it actually looks like a reprise of St. Mm -hmm. Thomas. Actually. So there's a whole section of my presentation where I talk just about that, where I, I do a comparison to the models that I, I brought into the piece. So um, it's exactly as you're describing. So I was using, in fact, the only, the only building that was fully designed was the, um, where the, was the housing. And then he used those designs later for some student housing in like Massachusetts or somewhere like that. So I had to, I relied on for, because we had to do, of course, detail everything. So it was like, what, what about that I-beam facade kind of thing, detail, and what's the curtain, and what's the... So they were all from period Johnson work from that period, from exactly in that period. And uh, yeah, it was... The guest house was built, and it was funny because it was a piece. It was a it, again that was an existing plan that Johnson just kind of pulled out of his bag. Um, the, it was actually a spec house that he was planning for somebody in Wisconsin, I think, for a developer. It was in. It's there, yeah. So it was built. I don't. Some, I've, I've heard that it's there. That it's been modified, of course, but it's but it's actually still there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If any, any questions on like Cuba or. U.S. craziness, or <laughs> Well, you're obviously going to have ample scope for opportunity given the current turn of events. Yeah, and I think the next embassy project I'm going to do is Tehran, so <laughs> it'll be interesting. Which isn't so architecturally interesting, but obviously it's an interesting. You know, I'm obviously focusing on charged sites for these uh, for these embassies. Well, that was it. Mm -hmm. um, it stops to have that modernist intentionality, right? And so, where are you thinking again? Yeah, and you're discovering this now. Yeah. Work, and yeah. You can talk about that a little bit. Well, especially with this project, yeah. Yeah, and and also like uh, there's there's that beautiful article in our form about uh, the Trump Tower and the remnant of the country. Do you yeah. see um, <laughs> any specific influences that might be coming into their? Uh, <laughs> Into, oh, into the embassies? Um, I mean, just because those are the examples. 
It's funny because the U.S. has turned around. They've kind of, um, it's like enough of the bunkers. Uh, we want to do glass buildings again, so it's like transparency again, but of course it's thick, inch thick trans glass. Um, so the new London Embassy, different, you know, um, Hong Kong, not Hong Kong, but um, uh, I guess in, in, in a couple of buildings in China that they're doing are these kind of new opener, opener buildings, but of course they're set back 100 feet, blast walls, et cetera, et cetera. It's much more discreet. It's hedges covering blast walls now. So they're, they're making an attempt and, and to, to return a bit to that, to that idiom as well for, of that period, which I guess now is the golden age of, of embassy design. So something I didn't mention was the, the um, one way that they managed to do this, these kind of radical modern designs in, in the embassies was by getting around Congress, of course. Um, the way they did it was um, through a system called credit default swaps, which meant, which meant countries that owed the U.S. from the, after the war, um, so especially Germany and Italy, um, owed, owed, owed reparations to the U.S., were allowed to repay in materials like marble. <laughs> or, um, um, of course, and of course, all the allied, allied countries as well needed, had to repay the U.S. for all the money and all the weapons that they'd given them during the war. So, so Cuba was, the Cuban embassy was, uh, the elevators came from England, the interior partitions all were made, fabricated in England, the furniture, even though it was Knoll, was fabricated in France. So Knoll had to find French fabricators in order to use the French default swaps. Um, the marble all came from Italy. So it's like, yeah, of course we're gonna clad the thing in marble. Part of it was clad in local stone, just as a kind of local. But, um, but most of it, the, all the steel, structural steel came from Belgium, which owed the US money. So, so that was a way of getting around conservative Congress members and, and having kind of carte blanche uh, to do whatever they wanted design-wise. Um, they, were also, they were also getting, you know, like the, the whatever, their palazzo in Rome, the, there was the, uh, the, the Paris Embassy, which was a Rothschild, you know, palace. Um, <laughs> it's like, we'll just take that. You know, they went shopping again. So that's how they were able to, to, to get all these incredible embassies and build these incredible buildings was, was through all this wartime debt. Genius, really genius. Yeah. That's... Mm -hmm. And for them, Steve Holly is also the reparations project designed by one of the most distinguished modernist Alex Burns. Right. Uh, one of whose partners died in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was the BBBR. That's great. I didn't realize they did it. That's interesting. I didn't realize it was BBBR that, that did that building. Which is part, partly why it's not easy to touch it, because they are, of course, not yeah. a sacred legacy. So similarly done, done through reparations kind of yeah. thing. Yep. The Italians paid for it. Exactly the same system yeah. that, they, that they've been using, they were using in the U.S. at the same time. So another question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in fact, the, so I did get to meet the ambassador this winter and we became best friends. And um, he, he, you know, he brought me in to do and handed me to his staff and they're like, how do you, who are you? Like, how do you, how do you get like carte blanche to visit to the embassy? And I was like, oh, we, we kind of bonded over being like club kids in New York in the 80s. So um, I, met, I met him at a, at a New Year's party last year. And he, um, so he's, of course, he's, he, ha he actually hasn't been officially appointed yet, so he will, it's very unlikely that he will be appointed an ambassador. Um, so in fact, there's not a lot of rolling back that needs to be done because a lot of the, a lot of the Obama agenda in Cuba has not really been implemented. It's, it, a lot of it is awaiting uh, Congress, you know, uh, um, approval from Congress. So something like that, no, if his, um, his, he had a huge wish list, of course, he wants a new building. You know, he said, uh, he said, we have 300 staff. 
Um, it, what was funny is he had, no, it was like 200 staff, I think. They have a, so it's, uh, Cuba allows them, this is how diplomatic posts work, Cuba allows them a certain number of diplomatic appointments. And then, of course, Congress and the U.S. allows them a certain number of, dip, you know, budget-wise diplomatic appointments. So the Cuban allowance was always higher than what Congress was allowing. So he was hoping that the U.S. would up his U.S. staff that, so he wouldn't have to fill it in with Cuban staff because it was two-thirds Cuban staff at the embassy, which is not unusual, I think, in embassies. Um, and then he was hoping to build a new building or expand somewhere else because they, they can't really expand on the site. I mean, they could go behind. They own a building behind as well. A kind of a funny kind of castle-like building. So I think um, the, you know, it's been very clearly stated that the Trump campaign that, that they are canceling anything that, that Obama did. So it's really just like tabula rasa. So if that means Cuba, then of course it means then um, then all the restrictions will be put back in place. The ambassador will be recalled. I guess maybe a skeleton staff. It's funny because that staff, um, this special intersection was opened in 77 under Carter, of course. Um, like I said, working through the, Swiss, through the Swiss diplomats. And then up until a year and a half ago when Kerry went down and, and raised the flag again. So it was, it was maybe wishful thinking for Obama to actually do that and raise the flag and put the seal and everything because um, it, it's not really 100% officially an embassy at this point. It still needs to be, you know, to be signed off by, by Congress. So it's really, it's, it's really hard to say what's going to happen to all the airline flights and all the, all the, you know, the new trade that's happening that's, that's been opened up, the, all those Cuban cigars being sold in the U.S. now. Um, nobody really knows. So, but I, but it looks bad. I mean, it looks at, at the same time, it's something that's not, this hasn't been reported so much. Um, Cuba is changing enormously and their policy is changing. So each time, um, each time one, one side might make an overture, the other side of course is beholden to their internal politics as well. So they'll, um, this is why there's, there's actually a fantastic book. I recommend everyone read called back channel to Cuba. If you're interested at all in this subject, which is, uh, by this uh, author, is Corn Blue, and um, it's it's an amazing. It's the kind of history of, of U.S.-Cuban relationships and relations, and it goes through every every kind of overture that has been that uh, almost always secret uh, between the two governments over time. And you see over and over and over that it's internal politics that basically shoot down every every possibility of opening up. It's always internal politics, so, and, and on the other side as well. So what's happening in Cuba now is a kind of hardening. Um, there's a lot, there's a, there's a new restriction of freedoms. There's a, um, basically the military is pissed. Um, they've been seeing this opening happening. They've been seeing um, this, this new kind of private sector developing and they're not getting a piece of the action at all. And they're not making any money off this. A lot of people are getting very wealthy. They're all living on their $30 a month kind of kind of salaries, um, so that's one of the reasons, you know, that the that they're angry. So there's a there's a shutting down happening on that side. The secret police that we thought, you know, was a complete ac anachronism a year ago is fully back in in service. Everyone's being followed and everyone's being reported on. So it's it's a total it's a it's a bizarre return to the Cold War. It's funny on front on both sides. We never thought it would happen, but, yeah. Uh, on that somber note, uh, that's all the time we have tonight. Uh, so once again, thank you, Terrence, for your lecture. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you.